Hi, I'm Dr. Arlene Chapman, Professor of Medicine, Chief of Nephrology, and Director of the Clinical Research Center at the University of Chicago. I'm also a work group member of the KDGO 2025 Clinical Practice Guideline for the Evaluation, Management, and Treatment of Autosomal Dominant Polycystic Kidney Disease. In this video, I'd like to share some key takeaways that we've highlighted for kidney manifestations of ADPKD. The first area of focus in this section of the guideline is blood pressure management. Management of high blood pressure in people with ADPKD should include regular blood pressure monitoring. And that approach should preferably include home blood pressure measurements. It may also include dietary and lifestyle modifications and pharmacotherapy may also be necessary if indicated. Next, we take a look at target blood pressure. For people with ADPKD ages 18 to 49 years, with CKD grade one and two and high blood pressure defined as a blood pressure level greater than 130 over 85 millimeters of mercury, we recommend a target blood pressure of less than 110 over 75 as measured by home blood pressures, if tolerated. For people with ADPKD aged 50 years and above with any stage of chronic kidney disease, we suggest a target systolic blood pressure less than 120 millimeters of mercury. In this instance, this is assessed using standardized office blood pressure measurement and only if the target is tolerated. Now we shift focus to pain management. And the message here is pretty straightforward. Shared decision-making between the healthcare provider and the person with ADPKD or their caregiver should guide pain management strategies in ADPKD. This process is expected to reduce the patient's anxiety, increase the patient's cooperation, and respect the patient's personal choices and views. We need to listen to the people in our care and work out a strategy together. Our next takeaway focuses on gross hematuria. Healthcare providers should be aware of the causes and natural history of gross hematuria in people with ADPKD. We know that this condition can alarm the people who experience it, and so we need to be cognizant about providing proper guidance, and if appropriate, we may need to provide some reassurance to the people in our care. Our next takeaway on this topic highlights kidney cyst infection. People with ADPKD who present with fever, abdominal or flank pain, and increased white blood cells and or C-reactive protein should be worked up for kidney cyst infection. In people with ADPKD and kidney cyst infections, we suggest treatment with four to six weeks of antibiotic therapy rather than a shorter course. The focus of our final takeaway on this topic is kidney stones. The management of kidney stones and gout in people with ADPKD should be similar to the general population. Obstructing kidney stones are more challenging to treat in people with ADPKD and therefore should be managed by centers of expertise. That concludes our focus on kidney manifestations of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. Thanks for watching. I also encourage you to take the time to explore the entire collection of videos we've assembled on this guideline. We're all very proud of this work, and we hope it will meaningfully support both clinicians and the people we care for around the world. The full clinical practice guideline can be accessed online at www.kdgo.org.